Welcome everyone uh, to the uh, Center for Bioethics Research Ethics Consortium. My name is Becca Brandel. I am uh, the director of the Master in Bioethics program and an associate director of the center. And it is my great pleasure to welcome my colleagues today on the topic of medical research in Nazi Germany, anatomy as example for changes from routine to murder. Uh, the, before we get started and before I make um, introductory remarks, we have some housekeeping items uh, to share with you on our next slide. Uh, we encourage you to submit questions at any time using the question and answer feature on the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can answer, enter questions in any time. We will have time for uh, questions and answers following uh, our three presenters uh, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, we'll uh, select those questions and discuss them. And we encourage you also to keep the conversation going on social media using hashtag HMS Bioethics. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat feature to send a message to all panelists and a staff member will assist you in accessing the content of the presentation today. And if you like this, enjoy this presentation and feel that you've learned, uh, please subscribe to our newsletter, bioethics.hms.harvard.edu slash subscribe and encourage others in your community to join us as well. Uh, so perhaps now we can go back to the first slide and I can introduce uh, our speakers for today. Perhaps no era in, in uh, recent history for sure, have brought up more issues about the conduct and practice of medicine and research than medical research in Nazi Germany. And today I'm so pleased to welcome three experts to join in a conversation started by our good colleague, Sabine Hildebrand. Um, so uh, she will begin today uh, with her presentation, followed by two discussants, um, Danish Zaidi and Dominic Hall, who I'll introduce more um, extensively prior to each of their remarks. And to get us started, uh, let me introduce you to Sabine Hildebrand, who for all of us has taught us so much about uh, the relevance of Nazi medicine and research for bioethics and for our anatomical practice today. She's an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of General Pediatrics and the Department of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and a lecturer on global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Hildebrandt received her MD degree from Phillips University Marburg in Germany. She teaches anatomy and history of anatomy at HMS and Harvard College. Her research interests are the history and ethics of anatomy, and specifically the history of anatomy in National Socialist Germany. Her educational approach integrates anatomy, medical history, and medical ethics. Her book, The Anatomy of Murder, Ethical Transgressions and Anatomical Science During the Third Reich, from Bergen Books in 2016, is the first systematic study of anatomy during National Socialism. The biography of Jewish physician refugee Kat Butler was published by Heintrich and Heintrich in 2019. She is currently researching the history of the Anatomical Institute as a member of the Historical Commission um, from 1941 to 1944. She is also co-editor of Recognizing the Past in the Present, Medicine Before, During, and After the Holocaust, published in 2021 and serves as co-chair of the Lancet Commission on Medicine and the Holocaust, Historical Evidence, Implications for Today, and Teaching for Tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hildebrandt to present uh, the first paper. Thank you so much, Dr. Brendel, for this introduction. I will speak now about medical research in Nazi Germany and anatomy as an example here. And I will start with a very brief review of the uh, key events of medicine in Nazi Germany between 1933 and 1945. 
By 1945, more than half of all doctors had joined the Nazi party in much greater number than any other profession. From spring 1933 on, they tolerated or actively colluded in the dismissal and persecution of their Jewish and politically dissident colleagues, filling the resulting vacancies eagerly and without regret. The dismissed were then coerced to emigrate or risk imprisonment and death. Physicians and other healthcare professionals were involved in the development and implementation of Nazi policies that led to the extermination of population groups not considered worthy of being part of the healthy Aryan German nation, including persons with developmental disabilities, psychiatric patients, those labeled as quote unquote racially inferior, and most of all Jews. The image you see here is of the title page of the official journal of the National Socialist Physicians League. And very clearly our colleagues back then declared here, we take the lead in the Nazi policies. Psychiatrist Ernst Rudin was instrumental in formulating the Nazi forced sterilization law that was passed on July 14, 1933 the so-called law for the prevention of offspring with hereditary diseases. Psychiatrists, neurologists, anatomists, and others served on hereditary health high courts, which passed sentences on forced sterilizations. There were about 300 to 350,000 persons who were judged to be quote unquote genetically inferior and were sterilized between 1933 and 1945. Gynecologists honed their technical skills and published them with statistics and books that were read around the world. This here is one example of such a book. It made its way into a Brooklyn library. It was published in 1936. In the same year, the Nazi government actually decided to forbid any further publications of uh, statistics to keep the whole event secret from the German population. From 1939 on, psychiatrists and neuropathologists collabor collaborated in the government authorized so-called euthanasia program, which occurred in several stages and resulted in the killing of 250 to 300,000 psychiatric patients and others in Germany and the occupied territories. Physicians, nurses, and midwives reported patients to the authorities. They also served as personnel in the six centralized psychiatric killing centers. There were no negative repercussions if they did not participate, but many did so by free choice and out of conviction. The image you see is of one of those killing centers, Hartheim Castle Hospital, and you see smoke of rising from the crematory in 1940, where the victims of this murder program were burned. Patients were murdered by medication, starvation, and in gas chambers that were built specifically for this purpose. And the knowledge gained in these killings, particularly in the gassing, was then used in the creation of the extermination camps of the Holocaust, with the transfer of health personnel and quote unquote technical expertise acquired in the euthanasia murders. In addition, Nazi laws and inhumane practices led to the increasing numbers of victims and their bodies and life and death were eagerly used by clinicians and medical scientists for teaching and research. Physicians often affiliated with German medical schools performed coercive and brutal experiments in camps as S. Steve uh, Heinrich Himmler made prisoners available for these experiments. And you see here, from work by Paul Weindling, the UK medical historian and his group, that the number of these experiments rose exponentially during the war year. Many of these experiments only became known to the wider world during the Nuremberg medical trials in 1946-47. Of the 23 defendants, 20 were physicians, and among the experiments investigated were the high altitude and low temperature and drinking of seawater experiments in Dachau, the typhus and infectious jaundice experiments, then in Ravensbrück, the sulfonamide bone grafting and cellulitic experiments, and at Nutzweiler camp, the mustard gas experiments. And in addition, other medical crimes were investigated there, the collection of skulls of Jews for Strasbourg and the so-called euthanasia program. <laughs> 
Weindling and his group found that there were many more experiments of unspeakable cruelty with many more victims. And close to 30,000 of these victims have now in identified in nearly 200 medical experiments. I will now actually talk about the background of the collection of skulls for Jews of Jews for Strasbourg University. What happened in anatomy in Nazi Germany? I will start with Libertas Haas-Haye and Harro Schulze-Boysen. You see them here in the year 1935, a year before they were married. Libertas was a publicist in the German movie industry, worked in Berlin, and her later husband, Harro, was an officer in the Reich's aviation ministry. Both of them were opposed against Hitler and very soon found themselves as part of a group of political dissidents that later became known as the so-called Red Orchestra. The activities of these, this group were discovered in the summer of 1942. They were all imprisoned and put on trial. Libertas and Haro had their trial on the 19th of December 1942 and were sentenced to death for high treason. Like all prisoners on death row, she was, uh, Libertas was allowed to write a letter of farewell to her family on the 22nd of November, uh, December 1942, just three days after her trial. She wrote in this letter to her mother very clear ideas of what should happen to her body after her death. She wrote, as a last wish, I have asked that my material substance be left to you. If possible, bury me in a beautiful place amid sunny nature. However, this is not what happened. Instead, we learn from the reports of another young woman what actually happened. Charlotte Pommer had just uh, graduated from medical school. She was an aspiring anatomist and served as an assistant to Professor Hermann Stieve, the chair of anatomy in Berlin. She remembered later in a letter to Liberta's cousin, on 22nd of December 1942, 11 men were hanged and five women decapitated. 15 minutes later, they were laid out on the dissection tables in the anatomical institute. She, that is Libertas, lay on the first table and on the third table, the big lifeless body of her husband. I felt paralyzed and could hardly assist Professor Stieber, who as always carried out his scientific exploration with great care and uncommon diligence. After the impressions of that night, I resigned from my position. And whereas the young anatomist resigned from her position, her boss remained chair of the Department of Anatomy until his death in the year 1952. This was possible without any interruption after the war because he had never joined the NSDAP, the Nazi party. However, we know from his publications that he had used several hundred of the bodies of the executed Nazi victims for his research. And these were bodies of, were, uh, of persons who were executed in the prison system after civilian and military trials. Up to 1920, he had performed animal research on the influence of the nervous system and stress on the male and female reproductive system. And then in the 1920s, he started with a thought experiment he realized that he could interpret the situation of death row inmates as the reflection of his animal experiments and that he saw the imprisonment and fear of execution as stressors on the prisoners' systems. And so he performed research on the bodies of executed men. At the time in democratic Germany, women were not executed. That was, however, again the case under the Nazis. And so from 1935 on, Steve performed research on the effects of severe psychological trauma on menstruation patterns and the morphology of the reproductive organs. Now to understand what happened to, uh, to Libertas and what happened with anatomists during Nazi Germany, we have to look at the various facets of anatomy during that time. We have to look at the interactions between anatomists and politics, at the bodies that consisted in increasing numbers of Nazi victims who were delivered to the anatomies and were used there for anatomical education and science. And we see that the use of these bodies then led to very clear stages of an ethical transgression. And we need to talk about continuities and legacies from this history. 
The image you see here is a charcoal drawing by the medical illustrator, Leopold Metzenbauer, who in 1943 documented here the arrival of coffins with bodies of executed persons at Vienna Anatomy. Anatomists in Nazi Germany had a state supporting, a leading role in the state supporting science of so-called race hygiene, the German version of the then international leading science of eugenics. And foremost among them was Eugen Fischer, the chairman of anatomy at Freiburg, and uh, until 1927, when we became the founding director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology, Human Heredity, and Eugenics in Berlin, and also served as president of the University of Berlin. And you see him here in an official function at the university. Anatomists were trained as physicians at the time, and more than 80% of anatomists joined the Nazi party. As physical anthropologists, anatomists contributed to the scientific legitimation of Nazi policies through the ideas of race hygiene. They served as leaders and in research in this field and as leaders in racial theory. They served as teachers of race, race hygiene and as judges in the hereditary health courts. A Nazi ideologue was Eduard Pernkopf, an Austrian who in 1933 became chair of anatomy at Vienna University in the same year. He had joined the Nazi party and the stormtroopers, groups that were actually still illegal in Austria at the time, which had its own system of fascism. However, after the so-called Anschluss, the uh, annexation of Austria into Nazi Germany, he was made dean of the Vienna Medical School. And in this role oversaw the removal of 53% of the medical faculty for so-called racial or political reasons. He also became president of the university. And of course, lost all these roles after the war and was imprisoned. And after the end of his imprisonment, he was allowed to finish the work on an atlas of topographical anatomy of man for which he became famous around the world. It was, this book was published in four volumes between 1937 and 1960, and the first American edition, among many translations, it came out in 1963. It became enormously popular among physicians, uh, 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 particular surgeons and anatomists around the world because of the great detail it showed and the then new printing technique that allowed for such brilliant images as the situs of the head and neck region. However, it was already after the publication of the American edition that questions came up about the political background of the Atlas, questions that were investigated by general physician Gerald Weissman and medical illustrator David Williams in the 1980s. And then in the 1990s, a very loud public discussion came up around the very clear signs of Nazi sympathies that the illustrators had left in those images that had been published during the war years. Erich Lepier signed with a swastika. Karl Entresse had a double S in his name and used the SS runes during the war years. Franz Bartke normally drew his number four like this, and then in 44 used the SS runes. And these and other signs in these images led then in 1994, oral surgeon in New York, or Howard Israel, to contact general physician and medical historian Bill Seidelman in Canada to approach the Yad Vashem Mertais Authority in Jerusalem to send an official inquiry about the origins of the Atlas to Vienna University, where the historical commission was launched that became known as the Senatorial Project. This confirmed the Nazi affiliation of uh, Pernkopf and his illustrators. It also confirmed that bodies of more than 1,300 persons who had been executed in the Vienna prison system after civilian and military trials had been assigned to the anatomy department and among them were seven Jewish persons. It is to this day unclear which bodies of which victims were used for which images. And this brings us to the changes in traditional anatomical body procurement during that time which in Germany as elsewhere in the whole world before 1933 had relied on uh, very traditional legal sources. Those uh, were the unclaimed bodies. Unclaimed bodies are bodies of persons who die in public institutions and who are not claimed by their families for a burial. 
And in Germany, as well as around the world, among those sources were at the time deceased psychiatric patients, persons who had committed suicide, deceased prisoners, and among the deceased prisoners also executed persons. Now, under the Nazis, we see an increasing number of victims among these traditional sources. Among the deceased psychiatric patients, we have persons that were killed in the euthanasia programs. Among the suicides, we have increasing numbers of Jewish persons among the deceased prisoners, more political prisoners due to the new Nazi laws, more violence, especially in the Gestapo prisons led to more deaths. And in the camp prison system, we have a, a high number of so-called natural deaths. And these are not only uh, due to the camp conditions, and violence in the centralized concentration camps, but also in the decentralized camps for forced laborers and prisoners of war. And finally, we see a rising number of executions due to new Nazi legislation. In a democratic Germany from 1919 to 33, we have altogether 200 executions exclusively of men. And now under the Nazis, we have an exponential rise, especially during the war years, of more than 30,000 executions after military and civilian trials. And these included now women. We know that all anatomical departments use these bodies. There were about 30 uh, anatomical departments. And we have a documented number of bodies delivered of 3,963. One of the anatomists who used these bodies were Hermann, was Hermann Foss. He worked in Leipzig and leveraged his career in 1937 by joining the Nazi party so that he was made chair of a department in 1941. And this was uh, the newly formed German university in occupied Poland in the city of Posen. We know from Foss diary, which was published by Götz Ali in 1987, how he acquired the bodies he needed for the new dissection course. He writes here in September 1941, today I had a very interesting discussion with the chief prosecutor, Dr. Heiser, about obtaining corpses for the Anatomical Institute. So many people are executed here that there are enough for all three neighboring institutes, not just Posen, but also Greifswald and Breslau. A month later, he writes, tomorrow the Anatomical Institute will get its first bodies. 11 Poles are being executed. I will take five of them the others will be cremated. This means Foss had more than enough bodies, more than uh, bodies than he quote unquote could wish for. So months later, then he writes, the dissection of the organs of the executed persons were the loveliest I have ever seen in a dissecting room. Why were the dissections lovely in the eyes of the anatomical beholder? Because they stemmed from young, healthy Polish persons who had uh, been executed for their resistance against the Nazi regime. These young persons' bodies were also used in the production and sale of skeletons, skulls, and plaster cast masks that were sold to other collections and museums. And this was documented by Ali and Margit Berner, who is the curator of the osteological collection at the Museum of Natural History of Vienna. She showed me this page from the acquisition register from the day of the 22nd of June, 1942. Under the headline, Skulls and Plaster Casts of Jews and Poles, you read here, Jews and a cranium, that's a skull of a male person born on 15th August, 1908, was bought for 25 Reichsmark. The bodies of the Nazi victims were used for anatomical education, for profit in, the, in their sale, for the uh, acquisition for museum collections, for anatomical teaching collections, and they were used for research. Uh, this was not, we actually know from uh, uh, studies that were published during the war years, and for me the question came up, was this a practice that was up to, uh, to only in Germany, and was it actually occurring only during the Nazi period. And so I looked at uh, anatomical journal articles published before, during, and after the Nazi period and compared uh, the German language papers with the English language papers. And as you can see here, I saw a much higher number of the explicit mention of material from the executed in the German language papers, 183 compared to two in the English language papers. 
And when we look at the timeline, we see <clears throat> that these papers were published already before 1933. So the use of uh, these quote unquote uh, materials uh, became something of a gold standard in German language anatomy because these, uh, but, uh, these tissues were fresh, uh, quote unquote, fresh as in life, and they were at the same time quite rare. So as soon as the Nazis increased their execution frequent frequency, we see that the anatomists eagerly used these new body materials, uh, and we see an exponential rise during the war years. One of the busiest users of these bodies was Max Klara, the chair of anatomy in Leipzig and Munich, who uh, uh, published several studies where he used large numbers of human bodies uh, of the executed in his research. But not just the quantity changed, it was also the quality. And this has been first pointed out by my colleagues Winkelmann and Noack in 2010 in the seminal paper on Max Klara. In this 1942 publication, he speaks about the vitamin C distribution in human tissues. And in the methodology section, and for all the world to read, he wrote, the material evaluated in the current study stems from 15 apparently healthy adult individuals of different ages, who without exception all died of a sudden death after varying periods of imprisonment. A 33 quarter year old male individual received one pill of Sebian, that's a vitamin C product by Merck, four times daily for the last five days before his death. What had happened here? Clara had realized that he had access to the bodies of these prisoners before their execution. He could manipulate the tissues in vivo, then make the execution date part of his research design and uh, investigate the tissues afterwards. With this, Clara clearly, clearly crossed the boundary of the traditional paradigm that is knowledge gain in anatomy through work with the dead to a new paradigm first identified by my colleague Hans-Joachim Lang to work with a so-called future dead that is human experimentation. We see this paradigm change even more clearly in the activities of Johann Paul Kremer, professor of anatomy in Münster and an SS officer who in the fall of 1942 was detailed to Auschwitz. Until then, he had performed animal research on the effects of hunger. And in Auschwitz, he had two duties. One was to be present at the selections at the train ramp in Auschwitz-Birkenau, sending prisoners to the gas or to forced labor. labor or, and he had to perform selections on the prisoner's sick wards to select prisoners for execution. There he realized that he could now transfer his uh, research from the animal system into the human system, asked for permission to select prisoners who were quote unquote interesting for him, and then accompany these pris prisoners to the execution chambers where he took their medical history, then awaited their murder by card intracardiac phenol injection and then removed the tissues. We know this in such detail because throughout his life, he kept a diary. And you see here the copy of a page from his time in Auschwitz. This diary was found by the British military after the war in Kremer's apartment. And it became the very first document that proved that physician had performed inhumane human experiments on prisoners in camps. He was put on trial then for murder in Poland and also accessory to murder in Germany. Now note that Kremer had entered the camp without any plans for a research, but he there realized, quote unquote, his opportunity. We have, however, one anatomist who became the mastermind of work with the future dead, and that is August Hilt. He was the chair of anatomy at the Weiss Universität Strasbourg in the Alsace, that's over here in the occupied Alsace area. And he was an SS officer. He collaborated with the Ahnenerbe, the SS organization that studied race in experiments on prisoners with poison gas in the Struthof Natzweiler concentration camp that was nearby. They had the special small gas chamber built there for these experiments. In addition, he planned a large anatomical anthropological study, a so-called Jewish skeleton collection that was to complement an existing 19th century racial collection at the University of Strasbourg. For this purpose, 
He had prisoners selected over here in Auschwitz by the SS anthropologist Bruno Beger and Hans Fleischacker in the summer of 1943. These prisoners' bodies were then transported by train from Auschwitz to Natzweiler and there Hilt personally gave the cyanide salts for the murder of these prisoners to the commander of Natzweiler. 86 victims were killed in July and August 1943. Their bodies were immediately transferred to Strasbourg Anatomy Department, where the work on the collection started but was never finished. So there is no collection. However, he was named during the Nuremberg doctor's trial. He was not present at the time. He was also once again indicted for murder in absentia in the Alsace in 1953. And only at that time did it become known that he had committed suicide in the summer of 1945. Now, we can all speculate why physicians in Nazi Germany worked in the way they did and what they were thinking. Here are some thoughts that I would like to share with you. Medical historian Gerhard Bader said they believed their work was scientifically valid and thus justified. For them, the purity of the method was the only prerequisite for the compliance with ethics norms. And medical historian Volker Rölke says, they saw the availability of Nazi victims as an opportunity in the methodologically correct sense, but without care for the research subjects. We can say very clearly here, the extreme cruelty of their methods and unbearable suffering of their victims did not affect their scientific reasoning. Now, I believe there are many tangible and intangible legacies from this history. I can only uh, point to a quite a few of them here. And I would like to title this part of my presentation, Books, Bodies, Bones, and Brains. Charlotte Poma remained the only voluntarily retired anatomist. Few German and Austrian anatomists lost their positions after the war. The old teachers were the new teachers, the old researchers and new researchers. The studies on bodies of Nazi victims were published in journals and books that were read around the world. And this knowledge is now integrated into the general canon of anatomy. You and I have used it. Most notably, the Perkov Atlas and its often copied images are everywhere. Bodies, bones, and brains of Nazi victims were used in German and Austrian anatomies for many years after the war as part of institutional quote unquote material and collections. Despite previous investigations, more specimens from bodies of Nazi victims are still being found in ongoing investigations in institutional and private collections. Guidelines have been developed for the handling of remains, uh, but the guidelines, at least until 2017, never had any uh, visible input from the victims' communities. And so in 2017, we met for a symposium at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, where we discussed the question of what to do with Holocaust era human remains. And we formulated there 10 uh, recommendations. And at the center of uh, this, these recommendations is the what we call the Vienna Protocol, a response by Rabbi Joseph Pollack on the question of what to do when Jewish or possibly Jewish human remains are discovered. He speaks here from the Jewish uh, traditional um, uh, law uh, with respect to medical ethics also. And uh, I would like to point out that Rabbi Pollack is a childhood Holocaust survivor and one of the few experts in the field of what to do with uh, Jewish human remains from the Holocaust. He speaks here, and this is important, not only about the use of physical human remains, but also what to do with data from that were obtained unethically, data such as the Pernkopf images. I believe that the Nazi history of anatomy shines a clear light on current critical questions in anatomy as uneth unethical handling of anatomical bodies still exists. And here's just one example of body brokers uh, in the United States that act in a gray legal zone. Uh, <clears throat> they were uh, extensively documented in a Reuters series of investigative reports. These are private organizations that have uh, set up body donation programs where they uh, essentially prey on the indigent by promising them uh, inexpensive and dignified uh, burial 
of their uh, loved ones' bodies. And these bodies then <clears throat> are ostensibly uh, donated for medical purposes, but really uh, they, are, they are making a profit for these body brokers. They are used in, often in postgraduate courses, and you may have encountered them in, um, in um, postgraduate teaching courses. So I would urge all of us to ask whenever we work with bodies and tissues in our wet labs, where do the bodies come from? Where do the tissues come from? And in times of online anatomy teaching that has increased exponentially through the pandemic, we have to ask, where do the images and data come from? Where does the knowledge come from? Some of you may be familiar with uh, some of these uh, 3D apps here for anatomy that are proliferating now. Uh, it's difficult to get any true information about where they get their data sets, but if you ask long enough, you will find out that they're using at least one data set that goes back to the old visible human bot, uh, project that the National Library of Medicine put in place in the 1990s. And uh, that relies on a male data set from Joseph Paul Jernigan, a man who was executed for murder in Texas. And you are, if you have any ethical questions about um, capital punishment or the vulnerability of prison populations, then you will have ethical questions about this data set. At a minimum, we need transparency about the provenance of our images. This is also true for our atlases. You see, you see here on uh, the right side here, the Perkov original of an image that was then copied after the war by Erich Lepier, the same illustrator who had worked for Perkov was after the war employed by the Sopata Atlas editors. And he essentially copied the images from the Perkov Atlas for the Sopata Atlas. You will find these copies in many, many other atl uh, atlases and they are not, not uh, signified as uh, coming from the Perkov Atlas. I believe that uh, new 25th uh, Sopota edition is probably the first one that actually has an editor's introduction to the history of the images and shows the prominence. I would like to end now with one more legacy, the legacy of eponyms. I know that eponyms and the use of them is currently hotly contested in the question of decolonization of the traditional medical history. I would, however, remind us that eponyms can be teaching moments in commemoration. And I would like to end here with a commemoration of our former colleague, Lucia Frey, a neuroanatomist and physiologist who was born in the bloodlands, as Timothy Snyder calls them. Uh, she was born in Blof when it was Polish, it later became Ukrainian, and then under the Nazi occupation in 1942, it became Lemberg Ghetto. And she was killed either in the Lemberg ghetto or in Belsek death camp. She, at that time, she had already lost her husband, Marek Gottesmann, to the Stalinist purges in 1939. She had in 1923 published a paper on the gustatory sweating and flushing that is now known as the Fry syndrome. And it would like, I would like us to remember Lucia Fry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hildebrand, for that um, incredibly thought-provoking and comprehensive um, lecture regarding um, uh, uh, the many questions that we need to ask and will continue to need to ask as we, be, as we think about the provenance of anatomical specimens and we think about the very nature of our knowledge and our ethical responsibilities. Um, that uh, well, I know we'll have a lot of questions that are already coming in to the question and answer. And so um, we'll get to those in just a moment. Um, but before we do, we very much look forward to hearing the remarks um, and comments of um, Dr. Donish Zaidi. Uh, we are particularly um, thrilled to invite him back to the Research Ethics Consortium. Um, as a graduate of our first uh, class in the MBE program, um, and um, also at this consortium since uh, really uh, its origins um, in the very beginning. So let me tell you a little bit about him because it's quite extraordinary what he has accomplished in his um, brief career. 
Uh, Dr. Zaidi is a resident physician in the Department of Internal Medicine at Yale University School of Medicine and Yale New Haven Hospital. He completed medical school at Wake Forest, uh, his Master of Bioethics at Harvard Medical School, and his Master of Theological Studies at Harvard Divinity School. His research interests are at the intersection of bioethics, cardiovascular disease, and health policy. He has served on the board of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities and was nominated in 2021 by the president of the American Medical Association to serve a three-year term on the AMA Council of Ethical and Judicial Affairs, where we've had the pleasure of working together. At Yale, he is on the faculty for the professional responsibility course for first-year medical students. Uh, he is an inductee of the Gold Humanism Honor Society and a former participant in the fellowships at Auschwitz for the study of professional ethics. Uh, he's contributed more than 25 uh, peer-reviewed papers to the medicine and bioethics literature um, in his al already prolific career, and we are so delighted to welcome him to give his comments on Dr. Hildebrandt's paper. Welcome, Dr. Zaidi. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. B, and uh, thank you, Dr. Hildebrand, for that um, amazing uh, and, and harrowing um, uh, talk. Uh, I think this, is, it, it, like Dr. B was saying, it leaves a lot to, to consider. Um, so I, I had some slides of my own. Um, can everyone see those? I think so. Perfect. So um, to kind of jump off from where Dr. Hildebrand mentioned, I, I, I think that it's important to ask why we turn toward Nazi physicians to understand ethics and the lack thereof in the practice of medicine. And um, I basically wanted to talk about parallels and pedagogy and why this, um, this case-based uh, format is, is helpful for, for the work that we do. And I want to start by, you know, a, a quote that is oftentimes said, and, and I, um, I benefited a lot from folks that I'll acknowledge later in the talk. Uh, we, we had a discussion very recently, you know, the saying that comparisons to Nazism are fraught or comparisons to Nazism are problematic, right? And there is some validity to that, perhaps. I think that there is definitely hyperbole in sort of the day-to-day -day, um, practice of medicine, particularly since 2020 and onward. But the reality is... Um, we must, I argue, think with creativity and humility to mitigate against immorality. And I think there are still lessons to be, to be, uh, to be obtained from the study of Nazi physicians. And there was a question in the chat about how 80% of physicians in Nazi Germany were participating in these sorts of experiments. And how is it that such a you know, large population of the workforce is contributing to this sort of immoral practice of medicine? And I think it's worth looking at things creatively and humbly um, to see if we can put ourselves in the shoes of those in the past. Um, and when I talk about humility in particular, I talk about the humility that it takes to identify with perpetrators of uh, these crimes and atrocities, particularly in the work that they did, and then trying to draw the parallels in the work that we do today. Um, oftentimes, when I when I went on the uh, the trip uh, to to Auschwitz and Berlin with with FASB, the fellowship that that Dr. B was mentioning, um, in the first week. And even I think in, in, in reading about the Holocaust uh, growing up, you know, oftentimes we say, well, how is this possible? Why didn't anybody speak up, et cetera, et cetera. But then you realize that there are a lot of things that were actually happening quite close to home uh, that need to be unpacked and, and, and should cause us um, or should, should give us a moment to pause and reflect. So I, I talk about symmetries and I think that it's important to acknowledge symmetry with humility. Um, and look back at our own past and the American past specifically um, in terms of unpacking sort of why the practice of medicine can be so ethically flawed, even with good intentions. Um, so for example, uh, the forced sterilization law that Dr. Hildebrand was mentioning, six years before that in the United States, um, Carrie Buck and Emma Buck. So on the left, you see um, Carrie Buck and her mother, Emma Buck, who both were um, considered immoral and promiscuous. The mother, Emma Buck, had actually had three children out of wedlock and was considered a quote unquote imbecile. Um, and a case was brought to the Supreme Court about forced sterilization for Carrie Buck, and that led to Buck v. Bell. Um, and essentially, the Supreme Court at the time, led by Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., um, 
allowed for forced sterilization uh, that states could carry out in order to protect the health of the state. And I think that um, it's just very fascinating to me how we know so much about forced sterilization laws and sort of a lay person understanding of Nazi physicians, but it's important to look back at the parallels in the American context and also the fact that Buck v. Bell and the circumstances around that case were actually used to perpetuate and to draft and to promote forced sterilization in Nazi Germany some years later. Similarly, um, uh, I was having a conversation not too long ago with uh, Dr. Jay Malone, who was one of my faculty members in, uh, uh, in the fellowship program at Auschwitz. And he was mentioning a very good point about how the Nuremberg Code, uh, which was um, written as first line of the Nuremberg Code is the voluntary consent of human subjects is absolutely essential, right? This is published in 1951, or sorry, uh, in 1947, and so, or 1946. Literally four years after that, Dr. Otto Gray at Hopkins did the cervical biopsy that subsequently led, of Henry Otto Lacks, that subsequently led to HeLa cells, and so without any consent. And it's, it's, it's interesting because the Nazi experiments and the Nazi process was at that point, public knowledge, Nuremberg Code had been drafted for several years, and yet in practice in America, um, consent was not obtained for the uh, ob uh, obtaining a sample and then perpetuating it. So it's, this is a uh, wonderful picture on the left here of the grandchildren of Henry Otto Lacks, who now 60 years plus after the, um, after the biopsy of the cervical biopsy are now actually on a, a governing body that um, deliberates any sort of NIH funded research that uses HeLa cells. Uh, so I think it's just well, obviously long overdue, but once again, it shows that there is a symmetry between what was happening across the pond and what was happening here. And it's important in the day-to-day -day process when we're reflecting on the ethics of these things to acknowledge that there is symmetry um, uh, and that even though comparisons between Nazism and us may be fraught or maybe problematic, we still must have the humility to unpack the, the, uh, the parallels between the two. So this is a, uh, just a really um, uh, harrowing and haunting kind of image. Uh, Diana um, Barry, uh, who's a professor, she, she wrote this wonderful article in the New York Times um, a few years back about the slave trade and the cadaver trade. It's sort of on the right um, is uh, another article that was um, in the Smithsonian that builds up upon what she had written, where they talk about um, Grandison Harris, who was actually a slave purchased by the Medical College of Georgia, taught to read and write, and then subsequently paid by the institution and was a free, a free uh, person at that point, um, but was hired specifically as a grave robber and as a body trader. Uh, and that was actually one of the reasons why the Medical College of Georgia had a robust uh, attraction to folks who wanted to study anatomy. And the reason why Grandison Harris was actually educated specifically was so that he could comb through funeral announcements and unfortunately go specifically to particularly black graveyards um, where there wasn't fencing, where there wasn't protection to rob um, bodies and then use them and sell them to institutions. Uh, so I, I, the, 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 commod the commodification of, of cadavers and bodies, as we saw in Europe, had already been practiced and perpetuated in America some centuries prior. Um, and so I want to go back um, to Buck v. Bell and actually briefly read uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr.'s Pete, uh, uh, quote from his opinion. So he's, he talks about, in, in, again, in justifying forced sterilization for Carrie Buck, uh, he says, we have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for lesser sacrifices to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It's better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover the cutting of fallopian tubes. And that crux 
that the rights of an individual patient can be infringed upon for the benefit of the greater good is a line that we balance on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and despite the fact that comparisons to Nazism might be fraught, um, we see those comparisons made day-to-day, -day since, particularly since 2020. Um, and yes, there is, like I acknowledge, there is hyperbole to this. And unfortunately, there is a lot of politics now involved in the practice of day-to-day -day medicine. But if there is so much vitriol, we cannot be dismissive. We need to look back and think about what are the implications of the things that people are saying. Um, and, uh, and I'll kind of get, get to, to one of the particular pieces there. So, so that's one piece, I think, is to acknowledge the humility, the, to, to humbly acknowledge and identify with perpetrators in order to mitigate immorality in the practice. And then I think the second piece is what are creative ways to, to develop new pedagogy that emphasizes those symmetries in order to kind of learn from it. And so what, what should we emphasize? And, I, and, and, and Dr. Hildebrand mentioned this, um, and I, I think one of the pieces that is key is we need to emphasize the shared factors across, I would say both space and time, but across time between Nazi physicians and also physicians who are training and developing and practicing and, and, and not just physicians, I would apply this broadly to the healthcare enterprise at large. So one of the pieces that I think is important to keep in mind is how medicine is practiced within a hierarchy. Moral development is happening during medical training. Um, we've all heard about the ideas of hidden curriculum and, and uh, myself and some colleagues, we, we wrote a paper on clerkship ethics. And one of the most uh, challenging aspects of being a medical student, for example, is not to deliberate who's going to get a heart transplant it's to figure out whether or not you should laugh at a joke that comes at the expense of a patient when a resident makes that joke and you have every incentive to laugh along because you're being evaluated because you are developing as a person who's, who's, who is going to internalize behaviors that you're seeing in leadership. So that has not changed. The idea of a medical hierarchy, and we see it in the military and we see it in, 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 in medicine particularly. And those two things I think are parallel between both, between both Nazi physicians and, and today's situation. Macro scale factors like institutional policies and government, I think is also a very important piece to emphasize in these pedagogy. And uh, I particularly emphasize the COVID-19 visitor restrictions. You know, when you go back to those photos of people saying that we're not living in Nazi Germany, um, hyperbolic, dramatic, yes. Nonetheless, the COVID-19 visitor restrictions that were implemented in, in, in the best interest of the patient and understandingly with very limited data in real time, there was a recent paper that was published in the Journal of Hospital Medicine that basically acknowledged what we intuitively felt like we knew that visitor restrictions were not evidence-based uh, and that they ultimately ended up being detrimental to both patient and physician well-being. Um, so, being mindful of how, how policies are enacted, how they're implemented, who is developing the policies. Um, and then similarly, government factors like care for the undocumented, care for the uninsured, there's things that are outside of the individual clinician's control to which they are still beholden in the practice of day-to-day -day medicine. And I think that has not changed from Nazi Germany to today. What policies, sure, but the fact of the matter is we do not practice in a vacuum. We practice within a system. Systems can be flawed. Um, and then one aspect that I think is also almost imperative to emphasize in these pedagogy is the idea of desensitization and compartmentalization. Um, Robert Lift in his fantastic book, The Nazi Doctors, um, talks about the idea of psychological doubling that is used to blunt um, sort of emotion and, and in order to practice medicine in a more objective way. And he specifically talks about physicians who are practicing in Nazi Germany and looking at the, uh, the conditions of the concentration camp and taking a step back, approaching things with a very scientific um, mindset in order to, to blunt the atrocity that they're witnessing every day. And we, I, I can only speak from experience, I see myself do that as well. Um, and you know, when you are implementing an NPO order on somebody who hasn't eaten and their procedure keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed, what are these sorts of things? Or, or when you see you're having to discharge folks to, to the street in the emergency room, there are all these atrocities and system errors um, and, and poverty uh, that you are seeing in day to day and you have to blunt to an extent to protect your own psyche, but you can't do it to the extent that it ends up robbing the individual patient of their humanity. And the last few factors that I think are important to emphasize are 
um, structural racism that's embedded and veiled in the objectivity of science. Um, there was a paper uh, that was published um, not too long ago uh, that talked about how many people in the lay population, and unfortunately more than 50% of the survey population within the medical field, had these flawed and not founded in science understandings of pain thresholds between white and black patients. And they particularly talked about thicker skin in black patients, um, which obviously is not founded in anything, but that sort of mindset can then end up leading to uh, bias downstream. Um, and you sort of see a similar thought process in Nazi Germany, where there was this mindset of painting Jews as a, um, uh, there's, there's terminology that I want to use, but basically th that there are flawed scientific understandings of the differences between one population and the other, which then permeates into, into policy. And that's why I think it's incredibly important to emphasize representation in both the workforce and in leadership and not only in medical practice, but also in the development of policy. So who is writing guidelines? Who is writing the code of medical ethics, right? There was a very robust ethics curricula in Nazi Germany that still uh, accepted and conceded unequal worth of human beings. Who is writing the ethics literature today? You know, and, and we in our own past um, have, have had guidelines that were discriminatory against um, people from the LGBTQ community. There is, I know that somebody in the chat mentioned something about abortion. The Code of Medical Ethics of the AMA um, has a piece of, on, on abortion that, uh, that discusses the law, which is not really mentioned elsewhere in the code. There are things that we need to keep an eye out for, and, and this is why DEI is so important. Uh, we need to have diversity um, and inclusion in all aspects of, I think, um, leadership, not just in the workforce, but I think higher up, because they will also contribute to a more just and more ethical uh, application of, um, of, uh, of policy. And so how do you emphasize it? I think this is the challenge. I think what we're doing right now is fantastic. Um, there's obviously different programs that specifically are looking at Nazi uh, Germany and, and learning about ethics or the lack thereof. There's the fellowship to Auschwitz that Dr. Brendel was mentioning that I was a part of. Uh, the University of Colorado has the Silvers Fellowship. I know at HMS, they were also trying to start a, um, a program that was looking at um, the Holocaust. But like I said, I think the, the, the reality is we need to figure out pedagogy that emphasizes the similarities acknowledging the fact that there are fundamental and huge differences, but we still need to emphasize the similarities with humility and creativity, and whether that be case-based, whether that be through didactics. Not every school can afford traveling to Germany, so how can we bring that to us? And I think, you know, Dr. Hildebrand's talk of kind of walking us through how um, immorality can be perpetuated in the system, it is important for us to continue to reflect on that. And so I just wanted to acknowledge some folks, um, particularly a lot of these folks I, I met through the FASB program, um, which uh, is, I think, one of the most, um, uh, it was one of the most professionally changing experiences of my life. And I'm, and I, I'm so grateful to have, uh, you know, kind of had the chance to talk to you all. So thank you again. And, and thank you again to Dr. Hildebrand for, for a fantastic talk. Thank you, Dr. Zaidi, and thank you in particular for pointing our attention to, I think, um, three Ps, parallels, politics, and pedagogy, and calling on us all to recognize both the sources of our, um, uh, our sources of our ethical beliefs, the possibility for transgressions, and how we use our humility uh, to look at both, uh, to um, advance ourselves as, as people and also as professionals um, within very complicated institutions um, uh, and political structures. Uh, I know there are a lot of questions that came up during your uh, comments as well, but first, I am absolutely delighted to bring us to our a uh, final uh, discussant um, who's going to, um, I understand, bridge us a little bit um, from the work we've just talked about, continue the discussion of uh, where we go in the future. So let me introduce to you Dominic Hall, who's the curator of the Warren Anatomical Museum in the Center for History of Medicine at Countway Library, a position that he's held since 2007. He received his bachelor's degree in history from Colgate University and master's in museology from University of Washington, Seattle. He earned an additional MA in liberal arts and history from the Harvard Extension School. 
As a curator, uh, Dominic's responsible for both managing the historical anatomy and pathology collections of Harvard's Legacy Medical Museum and developing the modern medical artifact collections associated with the center's manuscript and archival holdings. He is the primary point of contact for the museum and is responsible for its acquisitions, loans, collections management, research, outreach, and exhibition. One of his chief goals for the museum has been integrating it into the special collections environment at the Countway Center for the History of Medicine and orienting the mission of the historical specimen collection into the modern academic community and for greater appreciation by the general public. Before uh, his appointment as the Warren Curator, uh, Mr. Hall worked in Seattle's Museum of History and Industry, the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture, and the South Co Country Museum in Rhode Island. He is a past president of the Medical Museum Association. Please join me uh, in welcoming Dominic Hall to give his remarks. Thank you very much for that. Let me just. Um, so I am going to uh, sort of orient us a little bit more to the present, I think, in that uh, I sit in a modern anatomy, or not modern, a historical and legacy anatomy and pathology collection um, that is trying to make its way into a more ethical framework within the 21st century. Um, and uh, so it um, just sort of very briefly, so uh, the Warren Anatomical Museum was founded in 1816. So it's it's quite old in terms of anatomy collections within the United States. Um, this is the Warren in 1906. Um, and so that is actually in the main administration building of Harvard Medical School in the top three floors of a very grand space. So very much oriented at the center point of the uh, medical school at that time. Um, this is really at its height. It's about 14,000 probably remains are uh, in that hall. Um, and it is very much a, uh, it is still very much a sort of pre-war enterprise, pre-World War II enterprise in terms of teaching anatomy. And actually, which sort of ties us into some of these earlier talks is the war actually, I think, sort of forms a both ethical and uh, operational turning point um, for the collection. Um, so the medical museum landscape in the United States train changes really dramatically in and around the wars that you start to see a real decline in the operational capacities of many museums in the United, many anatomy and pathology museums uh, in the United States. And it's certainly true of the Warren. And a lot of this gets chalked up to uh, educa educational technology changing, um, the ability to actually view the interior of the body technologically. Uh, through x-rays and other evolving technolo technologies. They're actually giant, it's a giant space um, user uh, and space becomes more of a premium. And so it's it's space uh, is always an issue when in terms of the medical museum. Um, there's also probably the largest downward trend is push that pushes on things like the Warren Museum is this trend from macroanatomy to microanatomy. And so the actual, your actual tissue needs at a medical school uh, changes dramatically and that certainly impacts the Warren as well. But one of the things I think it's under talked about, uh, and this might be me more editorializing than than looking at things that other people have um, have written work on, is that it is really around this time that you find this really evolving bioethical landscape in regards to human remains, ideas of or informed consent, ideas of what it means to be alive, ideas of you know what it means to do ethical research really in some ways prob probably born from um, these analyses of, of what would happen in, a, in Nazi Germany. And I think that, that puts us further downward pressure um, where the um, there's something in Congress about having three floors of remains in the main administration building of your medical school. And at the same time, you're soliciting remains per the you know, recently passed you know, 1968 Uniform Whole Body Gift Act um, to have uh, individual have donors uh, donate their remains to your anatomy room, and so the Warren Museum very much gets gets falls into this sort of um, compression that happens. It loses its space, it loses its floors. The anatomy department itself um, actually, in some ways, ceases to exist at Harvard Medical School. Um, 
and then then the war museum and its collection becomes sort of orphaned administratively and that's what ends up in the center for the history of medicine and that's where we are sort of have been taking it and trying to figure out what's its place in this new new world and a lot of different things have sort of happened recently and i'm just going to highlight a couple of them that it, that the war museum has sort of played a part in um or that the county has played a part in and then i'll i'll, I'll sort of give off for the for the larger questions um so uh, dr hildebrandt mentioned that um the anatomosh table there's an anatomosh table in the Catway library and this actually has nothing to do with the museum's historical collection um but we did actually write a lengthy provenance statement about the individuals in the museum or excuse me in that uh or whose images are in the anatomosh table in sort of in order to inform um the user and you, you know give them the sort of they the user themselves to be making for sort of informed decision about whether or not they want to use images of an executed uh of an executed man uh, to learn anatomy, um, you know, probably the sort of chief ethical uh, ethical question in terms of the remains. There are actually four full body cadavers on the anatomage table, and the provenance statement goes through uh, each one of uh, the origins of each one of those cadavers, and so the user can make an informed decision. Um, it was also been uh, already sort of mentioned in the chat um, that uh, the Harvard has recently published a report on the human remains collections. Uh, they're at the university and that you know one of the larger holders is the Warren Anatomical Museum this was brought on by the investigations of potentially enslaved individuals in museum collections that are held at the may have been held at the or are held at the university um and so for the sort of first time uh the university as a whole is taking on this issue of you know we will of acknowledging these individuals of figuring out um and figuring out what the next steps are, but also setting up mechanisms of redress in a sense. Um, a returns committee has been formed um, where it, to sort of deal with and to talk about and to discuss um, in individuals and the remains who may no longer, um, should should be no longer um, held by the university. Um, a research committee has been formed uh, to uh, you know decide whether or not individuals uh, remains that are in these museums or in our museums should be used for certain uh, research projects. And so these are all part of this sort of, again, these sort of heritage collections um, being uh, really interrogated in a transparent and uh, operational way to try to figure out how we can take this historical legacy and uh, bring it to the place that we want it to ethically be. Um, and sort of one of the things I just wanted to point out lastly in some earlier work I did um, was to look at um, the legacy overall in the United States and what has happened to our heritage medical museums, our legacy medical museums. And this is just the Albany College Medical Museum. That's um, one picture is from their course catalog in 1899 and the other is the, the space in 1915. And um, I'd found through my own research through looking at historical sources that I've been able to sort of, uh, I've been able to find about 76 historical anatomy and pathology museums that were once in the United States, and they are all largely um, gone, uh, but I don't know if that really means gone. I mean, so I think that in the same way that um, Dr. Hildebrandt's work has taken um, her to find legacy collections from the uh, Nazi anatomy, that I wonder if more and more collections will surface uh, in the United States um, of from these heritage medical collections and then we will uh as a collective community have to work our ways through um through these opportunities of redress and so i just wanted to quickly run through some of the things that are happening uh, to the warren uh, as a uh, as a legacy collection um, and i look forward to the discussion that follows thank you so much for um bringing the questions that Dr. Hildebrandt raised um, into the present time um, and pointing out for us how much work we still have to do, both um, not just in um, figuring out the provenance of the remains we know that exists, but also finding the, finding the remains where they may be. And we've all um, heard many um, accounts of um, almost accidental discoveries with huge historical um, significance as well as significance for our uh, ethics, our morality, our humanity. So thank you to um, our, um, uh, thank you to 
uh, doctors Hildebrand and Zadie and um, our museum curator, Dominic Hall. And let me um, now uh, say that we have a lot of, uh, we have a number of questions and um, they go in a, not lot, a number of different directions. I'm going to, we have about um, 20 minutes for our discussion today. So let me, let me first acknowledge um, and thank uh, our um, attendees who brought up the question of, in some ways, almost the ubiquity of ethical transgressions in, um, in uh, medical, biomedical research, human subjects research um, that happen um, alongside many political determinations. So we've had some um, pretty, um, a lot of engagement, both questions about um, how this occurred both in Nazi Germany and in Japan, uh, studies that have been done in India and elsewhere, and then also bringing us really to the legacy um, in the United States of slavery and the systemic racism that ensued. So those are all incredibly important questions and topics. Um, I'm going to turn to focus us on two particular areas um, in the time that we have remaining. Um, and the first really, um, uh, they're related. So we'll come back to the human remains in university museum collections for the second question, because that's really thinking about where do we go from here. But let's start with um, a question that came in from Claudia Fernandez Perez, who asked us, what, rec what approach would you recommend taking if you find that some of the bodies or tissues you're provided for edu educational purposes or their images come from sources that you find to be ethically conflicting with your own values. What do we do about that? What's our response? Well, we we have this situation definitely in, in the anatomy education uh, at Harvard Medical School, uh, where I certainly uh, do not use uh, Pernkopf images, for example. Um, unless I'm specifically talking about the history of the, the Pernkopf um, atlas. Uh, likewise, we still have, um, um, at a minimum, as I said, I would uh, always declare to my students if I myself see an ethical problem, for example, we still have some, um, some um, skeletons uh, with unclear provenance. Um, uh, they are the only real human bones that we still have, but the provenance is unclear. So we use them only in very specific cases. And then we uh, tell the students about the fact that we're unable to clear the provenance. We're currently still using them. What we're going to do in the future will, will be seen. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying you have to stay in discussion, not come with perfect answers because we, we usually don't have them, um, uh, but be transparent and try to find out what you actually have in hand. At a minimum, you need to find out what you have. And I can't emphasize that often enough. I believe that Dominic's, uh, Dominic Hall's uh, provenance statement on the anatomy table is probably worldwide the first one. Uh, so I think we just have to start in these small bits and pieces and actually talk about this. Yeah. Dominic, do you want to add to that? Sure. Um, yeah, I think, so first of all, I think you should know that that is a very common occurrence and that, um, you know, opening the uh, cabinet door and finding a collection that you do not know the origins of, or if there are bits and pieces of information you may find some of that challenging. Um, the legacy is those legacies of those remains legacies are still very much, I mean, and, and Sabina can definitely testify to this as well, are very much still with us. And actually the, the American Association of, Anat Association of Anatomy is, um, is working uh, on guidelines for legacy, for found legacy human remains collections. Um, and so it's a problem or a challenge to be met, uh, and I, um, I think the first piece of advice I always give is, it, is for these kinds of things is not to close the door back, right? So you also are probably not the first person who's opened that cabinet, and then you know, but there's several people before you have made the decision to close the cabinet again, um, and so I think a lot of what people are talking about now, and, and even just having a program like this, is um, 
about how sort of the first step forward is is to ask yourself the questions and then to just to start inventorying to start making a to learning the provenance so you can even make decisions about what the future of those remains are yeah and to what what dominic Carl just said i would like to add do not just close the door but also don't throw them out because that has been uh, uh for decades uh, the the activity that we see in in uh definitely in german anatomical departments where basically these human remains were essentially put to the side and uh not just forgotten but also taken out of the department nobody heard about them again this has stopped that doesn't ho hopefully uh, doesn't happen anymore. But this also applies, and I would like to say that what we've learned uh, from this invest these investigations in Europe uh, to a certain degree is now repeated here in the United States with a greater awareness of the history of anatomy and the history of human remains uh, in the United States. We see uh, uh, a true effort to learn the origins of the uh, collections of the human remains and treat them as human remains and treat them as individuals that belong to a community. Um, that is what we're all learning currently. And there was a question in the chat, do we know, uh, are, are we dealing with, for example, uh, human remains from indigenous populations? Of, oh yes, uh, we actually, that's the only community that was able to collaborate uh, or get the government to actually pass a law on the return of human remains. Uh, that's the only community that I'm aware of around the world where actually a law exists. Otherwise there are guidelines. Uh, but we're working on this all together in a consorted effort on the local level at universities, like uh, just as Harvard has just now uh, published the report and has a commission on the return of human remains, as well as a commission, as uh, Dominic Hall mentioned, <clears throat> on what to do uh, it, it, when research applications are coming in. So there we have that new uh, research um, um, committee. Um, but also we see it in, uh, nationwide in, in the various uh, associations. It's not just the American Association for Anatomy that has a task force for the uh, formulation of guidelines. It also has a task force on its history of systemic racism. And uh, it's also the, for example, the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, which are to a certain degree our sibling associations. I've spoken enough now. That's all right. Donna, do you want to jump in on this or you want to wait for the... Uh, I, I, no, I agree with, with, with what everyone said. I, I think the most salient point there is to not throw throw away the, the remains. I think I think this is a this is a fascinating question that plays into the wider discussion of what do we do with our dubious past, right? Do we erase it? Do we learn from it? Do we preserve it and put it in a, in a place that is less offensive? I, I just think that's a very salient point. Um, and I think the, the Gila case is also a very interesting way to, to kind of look back and, and try to integrate the family of the folks who, who, who were wrong, uh, wronged and tried to incorporate them. So I think that similar stuff has happened kind of in the American Indian, Native American space where the tribal lands upon which a lot of these institutions have been built, they've tried to integrate those communities into the work that is now going on in the institutions. So I think it's a similar parallel. Great, thank you for bringing us to the to recognize so many of the parallels uh, within our own um, U.S. history, in particular. Um, I'm going to go to. We've been talking around a little bit the University Museums Collection report that um, Harvard released back in September, um, and I'm going to, as usual, thank Dr. Willie Lynch for asking um, asking my question, formulating it much more clearly than I. I could have myself. So let me tell you um, uh, what um, Willie's asking us. Um, really, what parallels do each of you see between your work um, on human remains from the Nazi era and those described within the Harvard report, primarily those from enslaved individuals? And we began that conversation. The interest, another interesting piece that he brings up for us is being particularly interested in views regarding questions of the proper disposition of remains that are currently held. So a two-part question really getting at the heart both of the provenance um, and the past, the history of uh, these remains, but also uh, the ongoing um, point um, that you brought up 
about going forward, uh, the respect for the humanity of these remains and uh, perhaps uh, uh, creating a legacy of respect um, and of a commitment to doing things differently in the future with, with that uh, respect for humanity at its core. Hard question. Well, I'm going to put Sabine on the spot because I put Dominic on That's the spot. Fine. The first question. I, so I, I didn't want to jump in right away. <laughs> um, but for me, so there's two things, right? My learning of what was happening in, uh, in anatomy in Nazi Germany has directly informed how I uh, teach anatomy in the dissection room with uh, bodies of uh, body donors. Uh, and uh, I, uh, it, it informs uh, knowing about this history of abuse um, uh, makes me stronger in uh, approaching the humanity of, well, not just our donors, but truly also of our students and our colleagues, um, but also of, um, of uh, the, the, those people who donated their bodies and recognizing their connection with the former person that they were. And this is something that we bring to the foreground in our anatomy education approach. Uh, and that informs uh, the atmosphere in the learning atmosphere in our, uh, in our laboratories. Um, so that's definitely something that is not just implicit but explicit in our educational concept. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, then secondly, in terms of what we should do with the human remains, that's something we've extensively discussed with our anthropology colleagues also in the task force. And um, they are really the binding in of that. So first of all, you need to do your research. You need to find out to whom these human remains actually belong. Then you have to locate the community of this individual and find out what they want to do with these human remains. And if you cannot find that out, uh, then you probably have a duty of storage of these uh, human remains and take the best care uh, that you can because you're currently the only community that these human remains have. So take these human remains seriously as belonging to an individual. So yeah. what, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Danish, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was, I, I, I was gonna echo on what Dr. Hildebrand was mentioning and, 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 um, and so, something that I've seen in the chat too with a couple of the Q and A's in terms of um, sort of services or, or acknowledgements or quote unquote funerals um, for, for the donors in, in these cadaver labs. And uh, there's so many interesting questions that come up with this. I know at some institutions, for example, students are told about who the individual is, what their story is, what the social circumstances were, what the pathology was, and in other circumstances, they are not. Um, and I think there are there is something interesting to be teased out there about having some degree of objectivity in the study of anatomy is also essential. Um, and then in other circumstances, understanding the sort of the psycho so the, the the social aspect of things is interesting. But um, one piece that I just wanted to briefly say, which I always found somewhat comforting, is one of my mentors taught me that. Um, one way to view these individuals is as your first teachers, right? And in some respects, learning from their body even after death, because Dr. Hildebrand mentioned they had a life before, right? What was their life before and what is their life now? So in some degree, I think what my mentor said was in some, some way, these people are immortal, right? And I think it's, I think that was a very fascinating uh, way to, to kind of view the remains is that they have somehow achieved immortality despite injustice, injustice that was done upon them in that you are learning from, uh, from them. And I, I just always, I just wanted to mention that because I've always found that somewhat comforting. Uh, Dominic, you wanna jump in on this before we move on to maybe one last question? Sure. Um... I think in regards to, to Dr. Lynch's question, if, if, if I'm really thinking about some of the parallels, I, I, I do think that there is, could be a, you know, when you're focusing on the individual's life and that leads you back to their, through their story to maybe some descendant community or lineal descendants today. So you start, you tell that story. Um, I do think we can learn a lot from the many efforts that are going on right now. So there's not, 
there's no there's no like one there seems to be a lot of different groups different really well-meaning people trying to sort of work their way through this ground um and so, so i mean usually when i listen to S savina's talks I, I find of another effort somewhere in you know in formerly like german occupied europe where they find something and then they're working their way through how um how to address how to you know what to do next with these with the remains and so i think if we start to look in in the united states about this history of in, formerly enslaved individuals who might um who might still be in museum collections or university collections i think we can start to look other places you know we can learn from each other or vice versa you know that it's a lot of new ground um and it's going to be emotional and fraught and there are questions of morality and and, and so seeing what everybody else is you know being a talking i guess i don't know that seems a little <laughs> too but stuff like this sort of i think helps and, and looking to each other um uh, to try to figure out the best practice uh because it's going to be very challenging to get it right if there is a right i mean yeah Right. Um, well, I think, you know, one one of the um, key features that's come through about something that is a necessary component of getting it um, right or as right as we can is really um, retaining a commitment and prioritizing a commitment to our fundamental shared humanity in this, right? Both, I think, from the perspective of uh, what Donish talked about and approaching this with humility, um, and that's really coming through too in the chat and in the question and answer that we can look at the atrocities of the Nazi period and of Nazi medicine and say that was then, this is now. But if we do not think about the, these fundamental conceptions of respect for humanity, we make small mistakes and big mistakes. We see them in our own history and our own account, um, as well as in some ongoing practices um, that uh, would benefit from uh, additional attention. I think, you know, on that topic of the fundamental hum humanity, I wanted to raise some ideas that had come out in the Q&A about how do we um, uh, in practice show that kind of deep respect. Um, one being through um, you know, thinking about um, the paradigm of the burial of unknown soldiers, those who have served us and give it, made the ultimate sacrifice, uh, whether voluntary or involuntary, right? Uh, are there ways that medical schools can establish a form of honor for um, unknown uh, 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 medical uh, research um, remains and how might we go about that? Um, and also a uh, second comment really about how might we learn from religious traditions and conceptions of life um, in order to uh, properly recognize um, the significance. So I'm gonna stop talking there. I'm gonna give each of you, we have about just about two minutes. So I'm gonna give each of you about um, a little, just a little bit of time for a final comment and reflection um, and um, express my gratitude on behalf of the Center for Bioethics for really beginning, uh, beginning this important conversation um, in this particular space on an issue I know that we will come back to time and time again. So, um, I'm going, I'm going to go, uh, first I'll go to Danish, then I'll go to Dominic, and then uh, we will give uh, Sabine the last, the last word. And we have just about 30 seconds. Of yeah, person. yeah, no, I just want to echo what you said, Dr. B. I mean, thank you uh, to, to both Dominic and, and Dr. Elderbrand for, for letting me, you know, offer my my response is, is I'm very humbled to kind of participate in the conversation. And, and I think I think the crux comes back to what you all said. I think it's important to continue to have these conversations, be honest, be humble, be be open to learning from the mistakes of the past and not forgetting about them. And I think if we can at least take that step, then we're at least on a better track than we were in the past. So thank you so much. Thanks, Dominic. Um. Yeah, just in, in regards to the sort of the the unknown soldier example, which I think is interesting, um, the that there is a decision that one has to make first when you're talking about medical remains that are in collections is that does this have we outlived? And I'm not going either way on this, but how we outlived have we outlived the research life of the remains in this collection? And that is, you know, and if you're treating you know you treat them as all you know individual remains and. Um, that's a question that people have to answer 
first before they make that secondary decision. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a weighty question. Um, but again, it's things like this talking about it, uh, maybe can get us to those answers uh, in, in at least a somewhat quick way. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for leaving us as always, or as almost always in these uh, sessions with more questions than, than answers perhaps. Um, and Sabine, we'll give you the final word um, on our time here together today. I would like to add that being transparent about the history and the present of what we're doing in the anatomy labs and the anatomy education has served us all extremely well. Our students have become much more questioning, much more open, and they have actually in our memorial service that they organize for our donors, they have included the skeletons of unclaimed donors. So we need to make this part, this history needs to inform our education. It needs to become a standard part of education. There was a question in the, in the chat about this. We need to have a curriculum that is history informed. Great, thank you so much. Thank you to the three of you for a conversation um, and uh, raising the ethical questions that we will all be grappling with for a long time to come. It's a pleasure, thank you so much. Thank you, take thank care. You.